All right, guys, there's a little bit more to talk about with this whole Jussie Smollett thing. According to his brother, Jaquai Smollett, Jussie has been checked into a psych ward. I don't think this is a big surprise for anybody. You knew that that man was out of his mind. I mean, at least I knew it, okay? Some people just think he was cunning that way, but I don't know, guys. I have some thoughts about this, and it's actually something that I spoke about before. All right, so let's talk about why and how and should Jussie Smollett be in a psych ward, okay? This is the gospel according to Mark with a C. He is I and I am he. Just taking some time to tell you exactly what's on my mind. Thank you for joining me once again, my friends. And let's just jump right into this. All right, it is said, according to his brother, Jaquai Smollett, Jussie is currently in a psych ward at the Cook County Jail. Now he posted this on Instagram and he says, what's very concerning is that there was a note attached to his paperwork today and put on the front of his jail cell saying that he's at risk of self-harm. Hmm, do you think that this man actually saw this with his own eyes? It's on the front of his jail cell? I'm not too sure about that, guys. But anyway, he went on to say, I just want to make it clear to folks that he is in no way, shape, or form at risk of self-harm. And he wants to let folks know that he is very stable, of course, because that's what stable people do. They make up crimes and then go down shouting that they're innocent when they paid for some lawyers and have all types of high profile people who are in their corner and everything. There was no need for him logically to be shouting anything, you know? Like you saw the old gangster movies, yeah, go ahead, do your best, I'll be out before dinner, you know, or something like that. Now, let me tell you something, guys. Just to bring this home even more, I was once falsely detained by the police. Yes, me, a fine, upstanding citizen such as myself. Let me tell you about it. I was walking through the mall, right, minding my own business, you know, as I was walking through the mall one day. Security came up and said, sit down, we're going to check your pockets. We heard you've been passing off counterfeit bills. Yes, apparently somebody said that I fit the description of somebody who was passing off counterfeit money. Now, I know what you're thinking. No, I wasn't, okay? I work hard for my money, baby. But anyway, I had to be detained by the cops. It was outrageous. I could feel the heart pounding in my chest felt like it was about to bust through like an alien. I was so pissed off, you know? And uh, the guy was like, uh, well, yeah, they said it was you, except for one thing, it wasn't me, you know? So I was like, so you mean to tell me I could just point out anybody and say, this person looks like they did it and you would detain them too? All right, now I was getting pissed off, but one of the young hotshot cops, all right, he was a white guy, okay, just for the sake of the story, he actually gestured towards his sidearm, you know, towards his gun towards his Glock, all right? And I remember thinking to myself, this dude is ready for me. You know, he it won't take much. You know, I'm a big dude. You know, he's gonna put me down. So what did I think of, even though I was so pissed, right? I thought to myself, as you guys know, I've said many times, I come from a law enforcement family, you know? And one of the things that my father, my mom, my brother, you know, my sister, one thing that they've all told me and they all work in some aspect of the uh, legal system, if anything ever happens to any of us, we got your back. We got each other's back. Just chill, okay? Uh, keep in mind, you have to actually be innocent, okay? I've always been told if you're actually guilty, well, then you're just ass out. Nobody's going to help you, okay? That's number one. I think that's something that's missing with the concept of, account of accountability, by the way. You have to be innocent first, okay, <laughs> before you're outraged. I tell my son the same thing. So anyway, I had to be detained and I was detained for the better part of an hour. I was sitting on a bench inside of a crowded mall. Everybody was walking around. They, I was surrounded by cops, you know, and everybody was walking by just looking at me. Uh -huh, there goes another one. I wonder what he did. You know, in their minds, I was just guilty. They just had me, you know what I mean? And I guess I'm just gonna go down in those people's memory as remember the big guy in the mall who was getting arrested, you know? But anyway, after a while, uh, I guess a senior cop came over and said, oh, all right, well, one of the people who walked by, unbeknownst to me, was the person who said that it, I was the one who did it, and they said it wasn't him, okay? Of course, that wasn't news to me. Of course, I, I knew I didn't do it. But they were like, no, nah, it wasn't him, so you know, he's free to go. They're like, well, we hope you understand and everything, but we have to go by the report. And I'm like, man, okay, fine. Okay, but the point of the matter is, is that I was, I knew 
to keep my calm and to keep my cool because I knew that people had my back. A good support system, okay? My family, people that I really can trust. So all I'm saying, I say this to say that Jesse Smollett, there's something not going all the way to the top when you feel, even though you have all of these high paid representatives and all of these high profile celebrities, you still feel that you have to go out yelling in all of that stuff. You're pretty high profile, dude. You know what I mean? And everybody else who's around you is pretty high profile. You know, something has to click on that. Eh, yeah, if you get arrested and you get put in jail, people probably don't want the smoke of knowing that you died in their custody in front of everybody, in front of the whole world. But, you know, that's kind of what tips me off that he might just be a little off center. I guess you guys can give me your, you know, uh, opinions in the uh, comments. But anyway, Smollett, he was sentenced to 150 days, like I said before. But remember, he went out uh, shouting, I am not suicidal and I'm innocent as he exited. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, he says he's not suicidal and he's innocent and everything. But I also want to point out to you guys an article back in 2019 when Jesse Smollett actually said that he was close to the breaking point. OK, now this was actually in The Hollywood Reporter, and I just want to read this for you guys. So bear with me. It says here the story, just to give you some context on the Billboard website, appeared in the summer of 2018, guys, even earlier, earlier than that. It was meant to raise consciousness about a ubiquitous problem in the hip hop community, a widespread lack of awareness about the importance of mental health. This was back in 2018. Six up-and-coming artists were invited to discuss how they took care of themselves. Among them was Jesse Smollett, who, in addition to his own fledgling solo musical career, played Jamal Lyon, a singer on the hit Fox series Empire. Smollett stressed the importance of honesty in his own internal struggles. And he said back then in 2018, I admit that I'm jealous. I admit that I'm insecure and that I'm not good at certain things. Then, in a comment that didn't get any attention at the time, Smollett suggested that these pressures might be catching up to him. He said, I'm in my 30s and I'm trying my best to learn that I can't bend anymore. He said, I'm about to break. Okay? He said that back in 2018. I can't bend anymore. I'm about to break. Does that sound like somebody who you wouldn't think might just be a little bit capable of doing something self-destructive, harming themselves perhaps, out of his own mouth. That's what he said, okay? Even the director or creator of his show, all right, um, Daniels, what's, what's his name? What's his first name, Lee Daniels? He said, I've had conversations with him and he's in a lot of pain, all right? If he's guilty, then I'm worried about his mental health. All right, that's what he said probably a couple of years ago, okay? So this is what you're dealing with. And I just wanted to point this out, guys, because this goes to what I was saying. Now, you have all of these celebrities, all of these SJWs who want to make this hashtag free Jussie, who want to have his back. You had Kamala Harris, uh, Professor Giggles, or Dr. Giggles, as I call her, Kamala. <laughs> she could probably use some mental health evaluation herself, but that's your vice president. But anyway, you have all of these high profile SJWs who want to make him the poster boy for racial injustice, right? But at what point do these people become more exploitative? Exploitative, Explo yeah, they're exploiting him, okay? At what point do you identify that? If the man truly is off his rocker or he needs help, let's just put it that way, okay? I don't wanna sound insensitive, but if he needs help, then who is it really helping if you enable him in his delusion by saying he wouldn't do this and he wouldn't do that when you heard the man in his own words say that he's no longer able to bend and he feels like he's going to break. Where were all of these people something like four years ago when the man said that he was almost ready to break? Where was his family? Where were all of these politicians? Where was this hashtag free Jussie? Why wasn't it hashtag help Jussie? And this is what I'm talking about with the black community. We don't really love each other because if we did, that's what the hashtag would have been a few years ago. Hashtag help Jussie. Hashtag support Jussie. Hashtag help each other. But no, we rather buy into this mythical, strong black woman, an invincible black man stereotype. 
where we just feel like we can just walk around. We're bulletproof. I've been shot a few times, but I don't walk with a limp. I'm all right. That's 50 Cent. That's what we are. We don't support each other. And this is the thing that I've been talking about over and over and over on these videos. I don't know how long it's going to take for us to fix inside before we start trying to project outside. All right. That's what it is. You can take a knee, but you might have, you might have uh, sore knees. Get your knees fixed before you take a knee. You know what I mean? That's, I know it's a messed up metaphor, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Fix yourself before you try to, you know, attack and project onto other people, all right? But since we don't love each other the way that we should, it takes this to happen. Things like this over and over again. And people like Jesse Smollett, eh, he could have done it. He could have done it full well knowing what he was doing, okay? But even still, that comes from the narrative of victimhood that is running through our community like a, a plague, all right? And it, it really affects our judgment and our reason. And we can't keep doing this. We can't keep teaching this to our kids. We can't keep teaching them that they're victims and they can only go so far. And white supremacy, it's self-destructive. Can't you see that? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Throw off the chains, all right? The only one locking you in is yourself. You have to make better decisions. And when you see somebody who, you, who actually says to you, I feel like I'm about to break. You pull them in closer and you help them and you talk to them. You show them the love that they don't feel like they're getting because you're too busy believing in all of this strong black woman and invincible black man bullshit. You got to know, guys. You have to know. And I said I was going to work on the cussing. I'm sorry, guys. All right. But this is what I'm talking about, guys. So Jesse Smollett is in a psych ward. Okay. Okay. And once they get somebody like that in a psych ward, who knows what's going to happen? And I've always said that there's a lot of black people walking around here with PTSD, right? I'm sure of it. And a lot of it comes from their very own homes before they even get out into the world to experience racism. They're told what they can't do. They're told about that boogeyman that's out there. Hell, they want to teach it in schools. You see what's wrong with this, guys? This is what's wrong. We cannot continue to do this. All right. So anyway. Just wanted to give my opinion on that. You can get in the comment section and let me know how you feel about this. This is obviously something that's multi-layered, okay? Some of you are going to believe that Jesse just did what he did because he's a low-down, dirty, you know, so-and-so. And some are going to see this man is off his rocker. And some are going to see that this is what the narrative of victimhood brings. All right, guys, get in the comment section. Let me know how you feel about this. As always, you can like, you can share, you can subscribe. Catch me on Twitter. Catch me on Rumble. Catch me on Odyssey. I'm out there, guys. Thanks again for listening. Catch you on the next one. This is the Gospel According to Mark with a C. Rock on.